Hello, I am Alan Watson. Uh, I'm sorry this video must be a little late, um, but I was attending to some Yomeyama matter. I am supposed to read for you chapter 50 and 51 of the Ikabok book by J.K. Rowling. So that's what I'm here to do. So let's let's get this started. Chapter 50, A Winter's Journey. No harder journey had been made in all of Cornucopia's history than the track of those four young people to the marshlands. It was the bitterest winter the kingdom had seen for a hundred years, and by the time the dark outline of Jeroboam, Jeroboam, yeah, Jeroboam, um, had vanished behind them, the snow was falling so thickly it dazzled their eyes with whiteness. Their thin, patched clothes and their torn blankets were no match for the freezing air, which bit at every part of them, like tiny, sharp-toothed wolves. If not for Martha, it would have been impossible to find their way, but she was familiar with the country north of Jeroboam, and in spite of the thick snow now covering every landmark, landmark she recognized old trees she used to climb, odd-shaped rocks that had always been there, and ramshackle sheeps, sheep sheds that had once belonged to neighbors. Even so, the further north they traveled, the more all of them want, okay, the more all of them wondered, sorry, um, in their hearts whether the journey would kill them. Yeah, more they wondered whether their heart, whether the journey will kill them. Through, though they never spoke the thought out loud, each felt their body plead with them to stop, to lay down in the ice, straw of some abandoned barn, and give up. On the third night, Martha knew they were close, because she could smell the familiar ooze and brackish water and of the, uh, of the marsh. All of them regained a little hope. They strained their eyes for any sign of torches and fire in the soldiers' encampment and imagined they heard men talking and the jingling of horses, of horses' harnesses, though the whistling wind, through the whistling wind. Every now and then they saw a glint in the distance or heard a noise, but it was always just the moonlight reflecting on a frozen puddle or a tree crackling in the blizzard. Creaking, sorry, creaking in the blizzard. <laughs> As I said, I get a little mixed with letters, but let's keep this going. Um, at last, they reached the ledge of, they reached the edge, see what I mean? <laughs> they reached the edge of the wide expanse of rock, marsh, and rustling weed and they realized there were no soldiers there at all. The winter storms had caused a retreat. The commander, who was privately certain there was no Ikabok, had decided that he wasn't going to let his, uh, his men freeze to death just to please uh, Lord Spittleworth. So he'd given the order to head south, and if it hadn't been for the thick snow, which was still falling so fast it covered all the tracks, the friends might have been able to see the soldiers. Five days odd footprints. Going in, uh, going in the opposite direction. Look, said Roderick, pointing as he shivered. They were here. A wagon had been abandoned in the snow because it, it got stuck. And the soldiers wanted to escape the storm quickly. The foursome approached the wagon and saw food. Food such as Bert, Daisy, and Roderick remembered only from their dreams, and which Martha had never seen, seen in her life. Heaps of creamy uh, Crutzberg cheeses, piles of uh, cho Chokesville pastries, sausages, and venison pies of Barnes Barnstown, all sent to keep the camp commander and his soldiers happy, because there was no food to be had in the marshlands. 
Bert reached out numb fingers to try and take a, uh, a to try and take a pie, but the thick layer of ice now covered the food, and his fingers simply slid off. He turned all he turned a hopeless face to Daisy, Martha, and Roderick, all of whose lips were now blue. Nobody said anything. They knew they were going to die of cold on the edge of the ice, the, the Ichabox Marsh, and none of them really cared any longer. Daisy was so cold that to sleep uh, forever seemed like a wonderful idea. She barely left. Uh, she barely felt the added chill as she snack slowly into the snow, as she sank slowly into the snow. Um, Bert sank down and put his arms around her, but he was, uh, oh, that's, that's my dog. <laughs> um, he was, okay, well, uh, sorry, I, I got a bit distracted there. Bert was sunk down, put his arms around her, but he too was feeling sleepy and strange. Martha learned, leaned up against Roderick, who tried to draw her under his blanket, huddled her together beside the wagon. All four were soon unconscious, and the snow crept up their bodies as the moon began to rise. And then a vast shadow rippled over them. Two enormous arms covered in long green hair like marsh weed descend upon their four friends as easily as if they were babies. The Ichabok scooped them up and Bear them, bear them away, and bore them away across the marsh. Interesting stuff. Let's 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 keep it up on chapter fifty one. Honestly, this is quite the interesting story. Okay, chapter 51, Inside the Cave. Let me get a little tea here. Some hours later, Daisy woke up, but at first she didn't open her eyes. She couldn't remember being this cozy since her childhood. When, she, when she'd slept beneath the patchwork uh, quilt stitched by her mother and woken every winter morning to the sound of a fire crackling, crackling in her grate. She could hear the fire cracking now and smell venison's, venison's pie, venison pies hitting in the oven. So she knew she must be dreaming, that she was back at home with both her parents. But the sound of flames and the smell of pie was so real. It then occurred to Daisy that instead of dreaming, she might be in heaven. Perhaps she'd frozen to death on the edge of the marsh. Without moving her body, she opened her eyes and saw a flickering fire and the rough hewn walls of what seemed to be a very large cavern. And she realized she and her three companions were lying on, the, on a large nest of what seemed to be an un, unspun sheep's wool. There was a gigantic rock beside the fire, which was covered with long greenish-brown marsh weed. Daisy gazed at this rock until her eyes became accustomed to the semi-darkness. Then, uh, only then, did she realize that the rock, which was as tall as tall as two horses, was now looking back at her. Even though the old story said the Ichabok looked like a dragon or a serpent or a drifting gull. Daisy knew at once that this was the real thing. In panic, she closed her eyes again, reached out a hand through the soft mass of sheep's wool, found one of the other's backs and poked in. What? whispered Bert. Have you seen it? whispered Daisy. Eyes still tightly shut. Yes, breathed, uh, breathed Bert. Don't look at it. I'm not, said, said, said Daisy. I'm sorry, I have to act it out. Um, I told you there wasn't an, an, an Ichabok, 
King Martha, terrified, whispered. Uh, yeah, yeah, tr tr yeah. Martha, terrified, whispering. Yeah. Um. I think it's cooking pies, whis whispered Roderick. All four lay quiet still, with their eyes closed, until the smell of venison pie became so deliciously overpowering that each of them felt it would be almost worth dying to jump up, snatch a pie, and maybe wolf down a few mouthfuls before the Ichabod could kill them. Then they heard the monster moving. Its long, coarse hair rustled, and its heavy feet made a loud, muffled thump. Made loud, muffled thumps. Thump. Thump. There was a clunk, as though the monster had laid down something heavy. Then a low, booming voice said, Eat them. All four opened their eyes. You might think the fact that the Ichabod could speak their language would be a huge shock, but they were already so stunned that the monster was real, that it knew how to make fires, and that it was cooking venison pies that they barely stopped to consider that point. The Ichabod had placed a rough-hewn rough wooden platter of pies beside them. Sorry, I need, I need some tea. Beside them on the floor. And they realized that it must have taken them from the frozen stock of food on the abandoned wagon. Slowly and cautiously, the four friends moved into sitting positions, st uh, staring, up in, staring up into the large, mournful eyes of the Ichabod, which peered at them through the tangle of long, coarse, greenish hair that covered it from head to foot. Roughly shaped like a person, it had a truly enormous belly and a huge shaggy paws and huge shaggy paws, each of which had a single sharp claw. What do you want with us? asked Bert bravely. In its deep booming voice, the Ikabok replied, I'm going to eat you, but not yet. The Ikabok turned, picked up the pair of baskets which were woven from strips of bark, and walked away to the mouth of the cave. Then, as though a sudden thought had struck it, the Ichabod turned back at them and said, Roar. It didn't actually roar. It simply said the word. The four teenagers stared at the Ichabod, which blinded, which, uh, sorry, <laughs> which blinked, uh, then turned around and walked out of the cave, a basket in each paw, then a, then a boulder as large as the cave's mouth rumbled its way across the entrance to keep the prisoners inside. They listened as the Ichabod's footsteps crunched through the snow outside and died away. Thump. Thump, thump, thump. <laughs> it's been a pleasure for me to read uh, uh, this this little um, section. It's been really fun. It's it seems like a really nice story. I should really really read the whole thing. I haven't had the chance, but I surely will after this. It's really intriguing. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and uh, well, follow me on on Instagram, uh, which is Alan Watson MJ uh, at the time. And uh, remember to vote in, in the show I'm on right now, Yo Me Llamo, in, in Telemetro. Vote through metcomgo and telemetro.com. It's a, a huge help for me right now. And, uh, well, love you guys. It's been a real pleasure. Until the next time.